Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 72. Today we'll talk about when will the pandemic be over, uh, some concerns about the JNG vaccine, but some perspective on whether it's really a problem or not, uh, and then uh, some more thoughts on uh, vaccinating kids and uh, what we'll have to do this fall. Um, one of the big problems is people are forgetting there still have to, there have to be three things you need to stop a pandemic. One, you need vaccinations, but you still also need to focus on your non-pharmaceutical interventions like mass distancing and ventilation, and you still need to do trust, trace, and isolate. And so you can't just do one of the three. You need to do all the three of the uh, of all the three and do them well if you want to stop a pandemic. Uh, the poster child of not doing them well is right now is Michigan. And so uh, you may have heard the Michigan uh, headlines about their hospitals filling back up again. Uh, if you look at uh, the numbers of cases they're getting, uh, they're actually matching uh, the worst outbreak in November and December. Uh, yes, some of the older people have been vaccinated, but some of the younger people are now landing in the hospital. Uh, so the death rate won't be, maybe it won't be quite as high as November, December, but it is already going up. Uh, and so they need to get this under control and, and others of us hopefully will learn from their mistakes. Um, you may have seen uh, in the headlines of CDC chief Rochelle Walensky saying you need to close things down. Uh, the request from the governor, a uh, Democrat, was just more vaccines. Well, it's too late. Uh, vaccines won't help right now. Uh, that's like using a fire extinguisher to put out a forest fire. Um, it's going to take four to six weeks for an increased vaccine supply to make any difference. And by then, lots of people will die. And so they need to stop spread. And that, unfortunately for them, that means back to mask mat ordinances, back to shutting restaurants down because they let things get out of control. And so we should learn from their mistake and not make the same mistakes that they've been making. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like I've been saying in the past, the, the, the ultimate judge of how well you did is the number of dead, not dead. Uh, again, the, this is Lincoln Lancaster County where we do still have our mask uh, mandates in place and we're being more cautious. Omaha uh, hasn't, doesn't have the full mask uh, for the whole metro area, but they've done a little bit better. Rest of Nebraska. Here's Michigan. You can see Michigan's rates, their death rates starting to trend back upwards again, unfortunately. And then South Dakota, one of our poster child of uh, unfortunately following the Great Bering debacle, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So if you look across the country right now, you can kind of highlight who's messing up and uh, fumbling the ball in the, on, in the red zone. Uh, Michigan being the worst, but you've got a lot of Minnesota, northern Illinois, of course, the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, Florida, and uh, North Texas. Unfortunately, maybe even a little bit in the Omaha area. So, uh, but it's also important to look at trend over time. Uh, so here in Lincoln, uh, our numbers were still sort of in an impasse. We're at the goal line stand. We haven't scored yet, but we, uh, we still have a chance though too. So we're, we're still kind of hovering there. Uh, if you look at Douglas County in Omaha, it's, you know, they look like they're about to let things get under control, maybe getting under a little bit better, but still their rates are about double what Lincoln's are. Uh, so we'll see whether they uh, can, can slow this down or whether they end up uh, following Michigan's lead. Hopefully not. Um, so the Great Barrington debacle, I talked about this way back in episode 45. And so the history of this was uh, a libertarian think tank hired a couple professors to write, uh, to write an article about how we could get to, quote, natural herd humanity. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of politicians across the world and, and many state, many U.S. governors uh, fell for this. Uh, all the public health experts out there, like at Johns Hopkins and Osterholm in Minnesota, came out and said, no, this is wrong. This is not going to work. Uh, unfortunately, we're learning the uh, how this didn't work, and we've proven that this doesn't work. And so the Great Barrington uh, critical flaws were a couple things. One, it was based on some incorrect assumptions. One is that we could somehow protect and isolate the high risk and let it spread amongst the low risk and get to quote natural herd immunity. Unfortunately, uh, most of most of us knew that that wasn't going to be feasible, and I'll show you some examples of why that what what happened uh, in a minute. Uh, the other it was based on a uh, flaw number two was that it was a one and done infection that you would get coronavirus, then you'd be immune for life, and you'd never have to worry about it again. And that turns out not to be true either. Uh, it's also based on an assumption that natural immunity is stronger, and actually it isn't. Uh, the, the the immune response you get from the Moderna vaccine, for example, seems to be stronger than the uh, the, the immune response you would get from a natural infection. Uh, for example. And so from the, the inability to protect the vulnerable, well, what happened, of course, if you look at this, the Medicare released the hospitalization rates by state uh, this week. You'll see that New Jersey and New York didn't do very well, but that's partly because they got hit first. They also made some big mistakes in that they were sending uh, initially some people with coronavirus back home to the nursing home where they infected everybody else. And of course, now it's out breaking out again there too. So they're, they're failing to do some of the, the three measures to control things. However, the middle of the country should have had been prepared. We had time to prepare, but many of these governors followed the Great Barrington uh, 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 theory, and unfortunately, you can see this in, the, in their hospitalization rates, but also that you'll see the same thing in their death rates too. And so it turned out it was not possible to protect the vulnerable. Uh, that just doesn't work for very long. You could do it for a week or two, but not for months on end. Um, 
you know, comparatively to that graph I showed earlier, you know, New Jersey has the highest uh, death rate from coronavirus, but here you have a case of South Dakota, but people who did do things right did do much better. And so uh, we have put up on the website, if you're interested, uh, on the healthynebraska.org, if you go to this page, you can actually click on various states, compare them to various regions of Nebraska and kind of get an idea about, you know, who got this right and who got it wrong, basically. Um, the other thing, the vaccines, they, the Barrington folks thought it was a one and done virus and it's not unfortunately. And so uh, some infections like measles and polio, once you get it once, you're pretty much done for life unless you have some immune problem. Uh, but there are other infections where, it, where immunity is either temporary or there are mutations. So, so examples would be uh, tetanus and pertussis. That's why you have to get a tetanus booster and a pertussis booster periodically is because the immunity uh, wanes over time and so you need a booster. Uh, influenza uh, is another one where there's no, so many mutations, you need a flu shot every year because there are new, different mutations every year. And it looks like for coronavirus, both of these things are at play. One, there are some new variants and mutations that will affect your current immunity, and there is some waning of immunity, so you likely will need a booster. Uh, so I suspect that we'll probably have a booster vaccine sometime uh, this fall or winter uh, for the new variants. And there's some infections where we just don't have a vaccine and, and, uh, and can't cure it sometimes, so herpes and HIV, for example. So not all infections are, are the same, and so the Great Barrington folks thought this was one and done, and unfortunately this is not this that type of virus. Uh, and of course, this was proven by Brazil that this was wrong because they thought they had uh, herd immunity in Manaus, only to find out six to eight months later that the immunity waned, new variant came in, and their, ne their uh, next outbreak was worse than the first. And Brazil right now has the highest fatality rates in the entire world, uh, with uh, you know right there at the point of three to four thousand deaths per day, going through a whole second round because they also believed in this Great Barrington debacle. So uh, that's wrong. Uh, you cannot protect and isolate the high risk uh, like was theorized. This is not a one and done infection and natural immunity unfortunately is not stronger than, than, than uh, what we can achieve with good vaccines actually. Uh, so the next big headline this week has been the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so there's been a temporary hold, quote, and I emphasize temporary, because of six cases of rare blood clots. Uh, these are the kinds of things you won't find during studies. That's why you do post-vaccine surveillance, uh, and that's when you find things like this. And so this is not a, necessarily a bad thing. This is this this is a sign that the monitoring and the safety mechanisms in place are working. Uh, this is a temporary pause to evaluate what was going wrong. Uh, first of all, it helps to put things in a little bit of perspective. Uh, and then one of the best write-ups, actually, your local epidemiologist did a great uh, write-up yesterday on kind of all the whole factors that go behind this. So if you want a, a more, uh, uh, you know, a more in-depth explanation, uh, go to her Facebook page. Uh, but it helps to put this risk into comparison. It is literally, literally a one in a million sh chance of getting this blood clot. So graphically, if you looked at the chance of getting a J&J &J blood clot uh, for the six out of six million people who got it, this is what it would look like versus the chances of getting a maternal allergic reaction versus the chances of dying in a car wreck, versus the chances of dying in COVID in the United States so far, you'll see that the risk is not even close. Yes, there is a risk, but it's a very, very small risk. Uh, but they are putting a temporary pause in place just out of caution. Uh, I do think, uh, though, for example, uh, not only does, although J&J &J may cause a blood clot, so does coronavirus. And the risk of blood clots from coronavirus is much higher than the actual infection itself. Uh, and so for a good example, uh, as another comparison, is that birth controls also have a rare blood clot risk. Uh, however, the risk of blood clots is higher in pregnancy. And so usually, the, the, although yes, there's a risk from a birth control pill, the risk is higher in pregnancy. Uh, and so what they're doing right now is they're studying, okay, what's going wrong? Is there anything in common about the people who develop blood clots? Uh, what they found is they do have a pretty good explanation of, of how this is maybe happening. Uh, it seems to be similar to a, a side effect from heparin called heparin-induced uh, uh, thrombocytopenia, for example. We may find out that there's a specific subgroup of people that, that are susceptible to this side effect. And so far, it appears that these are the six uh, that were that had the blood clot were women of childbearing age. So it could be that uh, what we do end up out of this is maybe we have a hold on Johnson Johnson for women of childbearing age, but for older women or for men, maybe it's still safe because they don't have that risk, for example. Uh, an example that would be comparable again with birth control pills, they're safe for the general population, however there are some subgroups we try to avoid oral birth control pills on. Uh, for example, women who have migraines with auras, uh, they have a higher blood clot risk and because of that higher risk we usually try to avoid uh, birth control pills and use something else like an IUD for women uh, who are of childbearing age and have migraines. And so we may find something very similar for the Johnson Johnson vaccine. So this is a cautionary pause. I think that, I don't think this is the end of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Like I said, it's a one in a million chance. 
other things, well, you know, the outbreaks were happening, most of these are happening in kids. And so there's a good write-up in the Wall Street Journal that the recent rise in COVID cases, uh, pretty much not just in Michigan, but other states as well, a lot of this is happening in, in youth sports. And so in Michigan and Minnesota, a lot of those are around basketball and hockey, for example. Uh, and although those are initially, yes, those children are probably lower risk, then they bring it home to mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. And so you can't keep those infections away from the high-risk folks uh, in a community. So we need to stop those infections as well. So for us to get through this pandemic, we have to figure out what we're going to do in terms of vaccinating children. And so some of you know that the Pfizer vaccine is okay uh, for six, ages 16 and above, and it was announced uh, yesterday that we will start vaccinating uh, high school students 16 and above with the Pfizer vaccine. And this is what we'll have to do if we want to get this all under control. So to, again, to get this under control, we have to do all three of these vaccines, plus the non-pharmaceutical pharmaceutical interventions like wearing a mask, plus we need to keep doing test, trace, and isolate. Uh, unless we get all three of these right, we're going to be dealing with this, uh, who knows how long, six months, 12 months, another two years, I don't know. Hopefully we can get everybody to get this right and have the right things put in place. Um, so vaccination rates, uh, was announced in the paper this morning that Lincoln has 39% uh, of people vaccinated, however, uh, which is a little off of what the state says, but I think the state website is a little slower than, this, than the local website. But I'll point out, though, that's only for the total population over the age of 16. And so that means we don't have 35 or 39% of the whole population vaccinated, just the population over 16. So the effective, we're talking 25, 30%, that's nowhere close to herd immunity. So we're not out of this yet, and we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do for vaccinating kids at some point. Uh, it's going to be a while. Uh, you may have seen that uh, some of the discussion about will colleges require vaccines, and I think most probably will. Uh, the ones who don't will probably give kids the option. So kind of like in uh, healthcare, sometimes in the past, uh, healthcare professionals were given the option, you either get a flu shot or you wear a mask for the entire flu season. I think something similar could be the case. So uh, some, may, some colleges will require the vaccine. Some may give students the option that you either A, get the vaccine, B, wear a mask, or C, do remote. And so there's some choice there, but you still have an obligation to protect everybody else. Uh, I would not be surprised if we have something similar in the K through 12 environment that once the vaccine is, is approved, uh, for us to get away from masking in schools may require something similar. Uh, it's a little harder in schools though because there's a, a there are some different legal restrictions. Uh, in college students, of course, aren't minors, uh, whereas a K through 12, you're dealing with a minor. You're also dealing uh, with some mandatory uh, requirements, and so there may be some other things that incentivize either uh, get vaccinating uh, and some other interventions in the school. Uh, I think there will be a lot of active discussion. Hopefully, it'll be a good open honest policy discussion this summer so we can figure out what we're going to do in Nebraska. So again, remember, steps to end a pandemic, you need all three, not just one, and we need to do all three of these well. But this is on the, on the community level, so what are you going to do on the individual level? Again, like we talked before, you have your own way to determine your own risk. So you need to try to be safe uh, for you, but also not spread to others. And so use these kind of things up together. So for example, uh, my wife and I are going to go on a trip uh, on a plane, but we've both been vaccinated. Uh, so that gives us a big reduction in risk. We'll still be wearing a mask on the plane, which is required. There is some distancing. We're going to fly Delta actually, which still has the uh, middle seat. Uh, plus the, vax, the uh, ventilation in the air cabin is pretty good. And most airports now are doing a good job of requiring masks and having ventilation. And so you add all those things together, that should hopefully reduce your spread. And so think of that in terms of what a, a risk you and also be your risk to everybody else. So again, like we keep summarizing before, we can keep Nebraska deaths below 3,000. We've got a good shot at it. But to do that, we all have to wear a mask around people we don't know with unknown vaccination status, avoid the crowded confined spaces, keep your distance and get your vaccine. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, again, the uh, uh, the past episodes are on HealthyLincoln.org's website on the face page. This is what I do for a living, but it, these are my opinions, not necessarily this of everybody else, but hopefully this helps.